<coughs> along with Kathy Lavoy, uh, with the Franklin Grand Isle Workforce Investment Board, Marty Manhan, and uh, the City of St. Albans, and then Catherine Dimitrik with the um, Northwest Regional Planning Commission. So, I'd like to thank Oh, yeah, we're missing one, but uh, thanks to the legislators for joining us. Um, plenty of food, help yourself, coffee, juice, and uh, thank you all for coming. We will be wrapping up at 9.30, so uh, there will be time for questions and answers, so thank you all for coming. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, everybody could introduce themselves and just talk briefly on what they're working on in committee and try to keep it to about two minutes so that we can have the folks uh, give us their questions so that we can address them. Do you want to start, Randy? Sure. Uh, I'm on two committees uh, in the Senate, uh, the Transportation Committee and the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee is really ought to be called the Tax Committee, but nobody wants to serve on the Tax Committee, so they call it the Finance Committee. We're, in transportation, we're, we're, we're slogging through the $600 million annual transportation budget, and I, I know far more now about paving and dump trucks than I ever thought I would know. It's my first time serving on that committee. Uh, a lot of work going on uh, to get a transportation bill. Uh, nothing earth-shattering so far in it. There are two really big and expensive projects, the Middlebury uh, Tunnel Project uh, and also the bridge between uh, uh, North Hero and, and Grand Isle. That's a $70 million project, that drawbridge, uh, which is, you know, obviously a, a great deal of money. Uh, on the Finance Committee, uh, we have dealt with a number of things. Uh, ranging from the $30 million uh, uh, amount, which is an estimate that Vermonters get, may get charged more as a result of the federal tax bill. Uh, and we've tried to come up with solutions for ensuring that that money, working with the tax department, uh, goes back to Vermonters rather than gets added to the pot and, and spent. Uh, so we, we pass that on. Uh, uh, we looked at it. It's obviously got to originate in the House because it's a revenue bill. Uh, and uh, it will come back to the Senate to, to deal with thereafter. Uh, we have been taking testimony on a variety of things, ranging from efficiency Vermont to determine whether or not it is in fact running efficiency, because that really is a tax on people. It appears on your electric bill all along. And there's always been some controversy about how that money is in fact being used. Uh, we took some testimony on Friday regarding the Housing and Conservation Board. And there, you know, we had a $37 million bond uh, for affordable housing. And some of us, I know I in particular, have concern about whether or not the money that we spend <clears throat> on that, it may get being paid back to the state based on property tax revenue. But what happens to the money when it goes to the nonprofits that actually build the housing? Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned that we've got right now about $200 million sitting on the books of the state being due from the Housing and Conservation Board and the Housing Finance Agency that doesn't look like it's ever going to be paid back. And I'm, I'm really concerned about that. So those are the things that we're dealing with right now. Thank you, Randy. Marianne? Yes, I'm Marianne Gamash, and I serve on the uh, Human Services Committee in the House. Um, and basically, we have been struggling with how to deal with the current budget um, because many of the programs in human services, some are being level funded and <coughs> others are not because of state and federal mandates uh, that require increases. So there's been a lot of reshuffling on seeing where we can put funds that make sense um, it, it, sometimes it's, it's like uh, trying to decide um, which child you want to put up for adoption. Um, and and that's, it's, it's difficult because the programs that are in human services, by and large, are needy and worthwhile. But um, 
it's, it's very difficult in this current economy. And so we don't know what is going to be happening with the federal budget. Um, so we're doing our best to try to just keep things, to, to not increase and to look to see how some of the programs might be able to work better or be incorporated uh, into, into other things. Um, and that's pretty much where we're at um, at the moment. We'll see what happens there. There have been an enormous amount of bills that have come through. Um, so I'm not sure. We I think we're going to be taking up or doing a committee bill on, on a number of issues uh, as opposed to, at this point, um, taking up another actual bill that's been sent to us. So we'll have to see how that works out. It's, you know, there are committee decisions. And, and so I'm hopeful that we, I'm hopeful that we will um, end the session um, in the spirit of containment. So, because we all, we all need that. We need, we need to contain that grow in terms of <coughs> money uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult. So that's what we've been up to. Uh, <clears throat> Brian Savage, I uh, represent uh, along with Mariana, Swanton, and Sheldon. Um, <coughs> uh, and I sit on the uh, House Transportation Committee. Um, we have, uh, like the Senate Transportation Committee, been reviewing the um, transportation budget, um, hearing from all the various factors that make up the transportation agency. Uh, the one that we're most familiar with, of course, is the trans that actually uh, takes care of the infrastructure of the highways. Um, as uh, there are a couple of big broad projects that Randy had pointed out that are um, going forward, um, and uh, of course the numerous amount of paving and other uh, miscellaneous uh, operations of the department. We've also worked on um, a bill to uh, develop uh, uh, procedures for saliva testing to test for, and this is oftentimes just mentioned testing for the presence of THC, but it also, there are several other drugs it can test for. And now that is going to not be an evidentiary test, but it will just give a uh, hopefully a roadside test to give an officer probable cause to either get a DRE, drug recognition expert, uh, to evaluate the, uh, the suspected uh, person, or um, to have probable cause with which to get a search warrant to take and bring the person to an ER and have a blood test done. Um, that uh, passed out of our committee, and it is over in uh, the House Judiciary Committee right now. And uh, we're also working on a miscellaneous transportation bill that has a variety of, of uh, 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 subjects being covered in uh, various uh, stages that, uh, uh, that uh, affect uh, transportation and uh, motor vehicles and things of that nature. So that's what we've been working on. And I hope, I, I thought this last week, that miscellaneous transportation bill would be out of committee by last week. But I don't that we keep adding different things keep coming up in it. But uh, we're moving along, and uh, that's what's going on. Hi, I'm Lynn Dickinson. I represent St. Albans Town, and I serve on judiciary. Uh, we have been working on a, a series of smaller bills, but our big bill so far that we brought to the House floor was the parenting bill. Over the past 20 years or more, the courts have been asking us as the legislature to go and set up some guidelines that they need to set up who can enter into the courtroom door as a parent. We have unmarried couples, we have multiple partner couples, we have um, in vitro fertilization, we have uh, gestational carriers, we have a whole bunch of things through technology and through society's changes have made it difficult to determine who actually is a parent in a multitude of cases where there's um, when before it gets to things like custody and child support, you have to determine who's eligible to be considered a parent. It was a pretty comprehensive bill. It was done by a fairly representative stakeholder, as they say, group of people who worked on it over the course of the summer. And there also was a National Uniform Parentage Act that we also used, as that they used as a basis, also the one in Maine. So it came out, and uh, there was a little bit of controversy over genetic testing and privacy and how to determine that, but generally it was a very good bill, and that did pass the House. 
We're also working on things like the bail bill. There's um, uh, quite a few members of our committee, and there's a, an attempt to create judicial reform to reduce the number of felonies, to reduce incarceration. Incarceration is very expensive, uh, but we're also trying to counterbalance that with the rights of victims. So we have victims' rights in there every day, talking about the needs for protecting victims. Um, we're also working, we just picked up, started working on an organized retail theft bill. This is a thing where um, apparently it's really prevalent in Chittenden County, but I think it's here as well. People who go in as a, you had to call them gangs, but there's like two people, usually it's a duo. We heard from the state's attorney down in Chittenden County, usually it's a duo. They work at the store, they create a distraction, and then they steal all the time. They go from store to store to store, and they're, um, they're having a really hard time because of the way the, um, the state statutes are written, that we really need to fix that. It's creating a real problem for uh, retail establishments. Mm -hmm. And um, so they have come to the legislature and asked us to work on that. So we just started working on that. Um, and that's what we're doing. My name is Barbara Murphy. I served the town of Fairfax in the State House on the Transportation Committee as well, so I think you've heard a lot about transportation. Um, I would add that we are looking to move our T-bill, which is both the, the transportation funding as well as several of the miscellaneous laws that have been spoken of over to Senate and receive from them the DMV bill. And we do hope to have a peek at a revised DMV manual um, for the state inspections, safety inspections on vehicles, which is something we've heard a lot of concern about as it became an automated system. Um, we also are looking at some of the impacts of the autonomous vehicles. We have concerns about as vehicles get more and more systems within them that do the job that we as drivers used to do, <coughs> drivers are um, not paying quite as much attention to the job they need to do, which is still be a backup, even if you've got everything that's available these days. So looking at the issue of distracted driving in that respect and whether there's anything we need to do by statute to enhance laws. Um, and with the electric vehicles, looking at a means of having equity in how owners of electric vehicles support the infrastructure system that the gas tax on our, our <coughs> gasoline purchase. Um, so one of the things we're looking at is how you would find equity with the kilowatt hour um, miles traveled balance against a gallon of gas miles traveled and, and work that out so we still have support for our infrastructure as we move away from the gasoline and, and bring electric vehicles into the system. Um, I think that probably speaks as much to what we've done. You've got a good picture of transportation today. Hi, Cindy Weed from Enosburg, also serving Montgomery. Um, I serve on a government operations committee in the House, and our, uh, we're charged with things like the open meeting law, the public records request laws. We're working hard on revising that, actually updating it to make it clearer <coughs> so that uh, you know the meetings are open. In a democracy, we need to have open meetings. We don't want to have any uh, of our elected officials working behind closed doors. So uh, that's a big item that we're working on now. We deal with municipal law. We have a municipal <coughs> law bill as just like technical small updates and tweaks. Um, we do charters, city and city charters. Uh, last year we passed out a vital records bill, an ethics bill, and an elections bill. And this year we're also charged with doing a pilot project where we work to develop performance notes on our bills. So we make sure that we're looking for outcomes when we pass laws. We're not just passing a law and hoping it works out. This is a way that we can check on the progress and the expectations are right up front on the bills. Uh, we also are in charge of the Office of Public uh, Regulation, which regulates all of our businesses. So we're constantly tweaking that, deciding what businesses maybe we need to regulate, maybe which businesses we can take out of the system. Uh, we're also working on the administrative rules this year, which is the first time I've had intense exposure to that. There's like 9,000 pages of rules. When the legislature passes laws, it then goes to rules to, uh, you know, with the agencies, for example, if you have a human services law, you want to now uh, develop with the agency the legislative intent of the law. 
So rules are quite complex, and uh, so we're looking at reviewing the process there in our committee. Thank you. Uh, Dan Connor. I live in Fairfield. I represent Fairfield, Bakersfield, and Fletcher. Excuse me. <clears throat> I sit on the uh, Corrections and uh, Institutions Committee, and that is the only uh, policy money committee that there is in um, in the state house, uh, in the house rather. Um, so we're charged with policy for. Um, the corrections, and we're also in charge of uh, funding through the capital bill, uh, bonded dollars, any improvements to any of our state facilities, any construction, renovations, and that would include the proposed um, correctional facility that the governor has. Um, we commissioned a report um, last year to look at the number of beds that we have, um, beds for everything, for correctional facilities, for hospitals, mental health, for step-down facilities, um, for, for Resnick's, and the list goes on. And one of the reasons that this is important to all of us is we have a number of people that end up in the emergency rooms at our local hospitals for 9, 10, 12 days at a time when they are better served in a, uh, a mental health facility such as a state hospital, Brattleboro or Ruffin. Um, and so the report that came out outlining the, um, the facilities and the correctional facility is just that, it's a report. Um, we're not putting a shovel to the ground anytime soon. It's 10 years out. The governor did not put any money into the budget for that. We do have two critical needs um, right now, and that's a Foresnick unit for, um, for corrections, primarily. And it would be run by the uh, Department of Mental Health. And we also have a step-down facility, a secure residential facility in Middlesex that was built as a temporary facility, and if we don't do something now to make that a permanent facility, the government, excuse me, the feds will do a clawback of roughly $2 million. And Kathy's already told me that I'm over time, and so, um, <laughs> just kicking me under the table. Um, so if you have any questions um, about any of these areas, I'd be glad to stay after the, the meeting and talk with you. Thank you. I'm Carolyn Brannigan. I live in Georgia, and I, I'm the, one of the two state senators that you have. The other one is Randy. Uh, the Senate district includes all of the county of Franklin, but not Richford or Montgomery, not those two towns. However, it does include the Franklin, uh, the uh, Grand Isle community of Alberg. Uh, so we have a, a lot of people to take care of, but Randy and I we seem to cover everybody. A lot going on in the Senate right now, uh, but I want to start with my own committee assignments. Uh, my morning committee is the Agriculture Committee. I, I'm really enjoying that committee. I asked to be on there. Um, uh, we have uh, currently, um, uh, the big bill that we're working on right now is a, a rural economic development bill. It has um, some things that will help our foresters uh, loggers are people that work in the woods all the time, uh, and um, also uh, it, it will ease some tax uh, burden on, on folks that are uh, in rural areas. Um, my afternoon committee is the education committee. Uh, we have a lot of discussions uh, in there. Uh, I also enjoy that uh, committee. It's my professional field, although I haven't worked as a teacher for many years. It's, it's uh, been really refreshing and interesting to be on that committee. The topics we're discussing are preschool, uh, still a debate going on with uh, reimbursing uh, centers and private providers and local elementary schools and how much each will be 
uh, reimbursed and what the qualifications are to be, uh, to be eligible for that reimbursement. We're also uh, talking about independent schools. Uh, if parents or, um, or a, a local uh, educational authority decides that a child with special ed uh, will do better in an independent school, what are the requirements for that school to provide for that student? Do they have to follow the IEP as written? Can they participate in the IEP? Uh, that's been an interesting discussion. But I want to turn for a minute, I'm happy to answer any questions on either of those <coughs> as we go along, but I want to turn uh, to what's going on on the, on the Senate floor. On Friday, the minimum wage bill passed out of there. That's the, the bill that required $15 minimum wage. It's a staggered increase. Um, uh, that was, for the Senate, quite a long debate. Um, it wouldn't be a long debate by House standards, but by Senate standards, it was quite controversial. Um, I had uh, two amendments. I know uh, Senator Brock was, was on three, three different amendments, and he presented two of them on the floor. Um, I, I was disappointed that none of my amendments were, were approved. Uh, in fact, none of the amendments uh, presented by the Republicans were, were approved at all. So that has been um, voted in and now goes over to the Senate. I worry about the impact that's going to have on um, our businesses, our small employers especially, as well as our uh, town governments because they are also um, required to pay the minimum wage. Um, and the other thing um, that's sort of been an undercurrent topic, but last week quickly rose to the top, and that's guns. Uh, what, what we're uh, going to do, if anything, to regulate gun purchase, gun uh, use, and gun sales. Uh, on Friday, our, our governor said that um, he was bothered by um, the Fair Haven incident, apparently, just uh, by luck, we, we caught uh, a problem before it actually occurred. Uh, we should all be commending our Vermont State Police. They were the ones on top of that. It wasn't the FBI in that case. <coughs> so I, I'm really proud of the State Police. They are sure doing their job. But where does that leave the rest of us? And what else is brewing out there? Um, so I've had quite a few calls on that topic over the weekend. Uh, lots of emails, and I did it to myself. I put a question out there on my Facebook page. And I've had over 300 responses. People on all sides of the question. Um, so it's, uh, it's really been a great uh, source of, um, gee, Kathy's kicking me again, too. So I guess I better stop. If you have questions, ask me later. Uh, I'm Corey Parent. I represent St. Albans City and one third of St. Albans Town. I'm the ranking member of the House Energy and Technology Committee. Um, we've kind of, our jurisdiction as a committee is um, all over the place. It's IT within state government, the new agency of digital services. Um, it's also any energy issues uh, facing the state as well as telecom. Um, we've, we've passed a few smaller bills so far this year, um, including some uh, to increase efficiency standards on uh, various lighting forms and uh, appliances. Uh, we've started to take um, some testimony and we'll probably spend more time on the Essex plan, uh, which is also known as a carbon tax. Um, we spent a lot of time on net neutrality up to this point, but uh, the governor issued an executive <coughs> order um, last week. We had paused on a little bit because the Senate had acted, so we didn't need to act before crossover. Um, but it's an issue um, we're definitely uh, taking a look at. Uh, I don't know what the governor's executive order means for us as a legislative body if we're going to take any further action. Um, it kind of seemed to take a little bit of the, the pressure from some folks on the committee to move it there. Um, agency of Digital Services take up a lot of our time. Um, I, I get Cindy's piece on open meetings, but we've had a few off the record meetings just um, talking about internet security and data security within state government. Um, and um, it's quite eye opening, you know, state government for the last, well, forever. Each agency, um, until we create this agency, has had its different security standards and different um, firewalls, and some have been really good, some have been really bad. 
but overall state government got about a C, C minus um, on how we're protecting your data. Um, you know, this is data of our constituents and data of our programs. So um, we're working very closely with the agency of digital services to uh, design a pro to help them um, increase that and, and to further protect your data. Obviously, we live in an environment with Equifax and, and all that stuff where um, we're trying to keep you know, data that we collect as a state government um, as protected as possible. Um, we're also spending a little bit of time on the SMEAT program. Um, I think that is similar to what uh, Senator Brannigan's working on rural economic development. Basically, right now you're seeing, um, so this is, has to do with efficiency in Vermont, but uh, two businesses in Vermont, IBM or Global Foundries and Omni, at Omnia out of uh, Addison County, um, don't pay into efficiency in Vermont. Basically what they do is required by state to invest the same amount of dollars into efficiency programs within um, their facilities, but basically cut out the middleman. Um, and we're looking to do a pilot program, which actually seems to have um, some bipartisan support, which I think is surprising for a lot of folks are willing to have this conversation because the state colleges are asking for it, businesses are asking for it. Basically, instead of sending a dollar into efficiency Vermont and getting 20 cents back for 30 or 40 cents back, they want to be able to invest the money where they want it. A lot of them are finding that the efficiency standards of electricity, they've kind of hit their capacity, so they want to invest in thermos, thermal efficiency standards or transportation efficiency standards in their own business um, practice. So it's definitely something uh, we're looking at with an open mind in the legislature that I think could be a really big uh, you know, plug. Just businesses up here, you've got uh, the Rock 10 Mill or um, you've got You've got Perigo testified yet. Yeah, Vermont State College has again testified in our committee on it. Um, it. It's quite a broad group of organizations that have kind of hit that peak. So um, this week we're going to take more testimony from Efficiency Vermont and ask them about their business model. Does it still make sense to keep you guys pigeonholed in this model? So we're, we're, you know, we're looking at everything on the tables, but um, it, it actually has more support than um, I thought it would in our committee. So um, you know, again, it's just a pilot program. Um, but we're spending some time on that as well. And I'll pass along to Carl. Thank you. Carl Rosenquist. <coughs> Excuse me. I represent the town of Georgia, and I serve on the Human Services Committee. And we're a policy committee. And accordingly, what we spent the last three weeks doing is reviewing the governor's budget from a policy standpoint, uh, his ups and downs mm -hmm. in human services, and then recommending to the Appropriations Committee whether we should uh, acquiesce or <coughs> recommend other changes to the budget. So that's, that's taken up a lot of time. Uh, Carolyn mentioned something that I'm very concerned with, and it has to do with child care issues. We've spent a lot of time on that this last summer, hearing from a number of providers why they're going out of business or deciding to get out in the near future or deciding not to seek uh, a registered status, if you will. Uh, it's, it's pretty discouraging. I, I do also work on the committee at Northwest Counseling and Support Services, uh, reviewing how we can increase the, the capacity of our child care providers, because uh, there are a lot that are going out. And a lot of it has to do with the educational requirements that the new regulations have, have uh, how shall I say it, put, put into effect. And I'm concerned about that. I'm further concerned with what Carolyn mentioned here a short time ago, the, uh, uh, the follow-up to Act 166, which is the pre-K situation. Uh, we're still trying to sort through how two agencies administer a program together. And there's a recommendation coming out of, out of the two departments to essentially give most of jurisdiction to the education uh, agency, but uh, it's, they still haven't worked out all the details. I, I suggested to our chair of the education committee that why don't we really get down to the brass tacks and just divide the responsibility totally between the age zero to five would be the responsibility of human source, human, yeah, Research. human services uh, agency and to work totally really on childhood development and then from age five and above would be responsibility of the Department of Education. I, I don't personally think that'll go over very big, but I think it would solve a lot of the problems we're having. Anyway, I don't want to take up too much time. I know 
Kathy's probably, she's not close enough to kick me under the table, but she will. She will. Okay, all right. I've been Thank you. This morning. <laughs> I'm Chuck Pierce, and I represent four towns, Richburg, Berkshire, Franklin, and Highgate, and I'm vice chair of the House Education Committee. Uh, we've been spending most of the session on a 48-page bill on educa uh, special education. Uh, we've had 12 different drafts on this. We expect that this coming week we will get a final draft and finally get this bill out to the, uh, uh, the floor. Uh, what this bill proposes is to enhance the effectiveness, availability, and equity of services provided to all students who require additional support in Vermont school districts, including students receiving special education services and students who need additional support but do not receive special education services. To support the delivery of these services, this bill also changes the funding model from, for special education from a reimbursement model to a census-based model, which provides more flexibility in how funding can be used, is aligned with the state's policy priorities of serving students who require additional support across the general and special education service delivery systems, and simplifies administration. So that's basically what we've been working on once we get this bill out, and hopefully it gets through, then we will start to work on what Carolyn and Carla talked about, the pre-K bill. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Bior. I, I represent uh, the ranking member of the National uh, Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife, and I represent Highgate, Franklin, Berkshire, and Richard. Uh, our, our big bills right now are, one is called the Lake in Crisis. That was put in by mostly the, the uh, Lake Carmine Association. And what that's going to, what it proposes to do would be to take away a lot of the uh, rules and regulations that are now overseen by agriculture, the Department of Ag, and it would put that into uh, ANR, the Agency of Natural Resources. In other words, they'd be able to do away with the RAPs because they could they could do away with, with agriculture around those areas, any lake or pond that they've deemed a lake in crisis, and there's a criteria that they're supposed to go. It, it bothers me a little bit because they could shut out agriculture altogether. According to the bill, they would be reimbursed for whatever they lost <coughs> the farmers, but I'm not sure that I like some of the criteria because they could consider any lake or pond in the state of Vermont, as long as it meets this criteria, to be a lake in, in crisis. That could be a costly, costly uh, program. Another bill that we're talking about right now, or that we've been discussing, is the, uh, the carbon tax bill. It's not the bill itself. What this is, is a study to see what effects that a, that a carbon tax would have. And I'm not so sure about that one because there is another companion bill for the carbon tax. There's not much point in having a study if the bill was put into effect before the study. But anyway, that's the way we do things. Uh, coming up on the floor this week, there's the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife, what we call the omnibus bill. It's, it's a bill that was designed to flop all the little small problems that they have with fish and wildlife into one bill that you can vote on instead of having 10 or 15. Basically, it turned out to be a bill that's pretty controversial. It's the, what we now call the coyote bill. And that's, that's to supposedly stop the, the uh, contest, the coyote contest. But there's also a section in there about the uh, nuisance trapping, which is not very popular with most people. So other than that, I think we're, we've got plenty of bills to work on, but those are probably the most important right now. Thank you. And I'm on a uh, ranking member of the Appropriations Committee. And We've been working diligently on the budget. We expect to have it out in two weeks. Uh, right now, we're in the weeds. We've asked for reports from each committee 
on what their priorities are, and we've gotten them in, uh, at least some of them in, and there's a big increase in spending when we look at what we got. Um, right now, so far, um, we're about $400, $400 short of $32 million in additional expenditures if we took what the committees that have reported to us so far into consideration and added them to the budget. So that's all going to have to be pared down and looked at. When we're doing the budget, we have the ability to move stuff around in the general fund. The transportation and education fund are done separately, <coughs> and we usually take their recommendation. Um, there is a special project that they've had in the Agency of Commerce. They wanted um, $3.182 million. And right now, the pot is down to $2.4 million. And if we go according to what the, government, uh, the governor wants to extend, it's uh, going to be down probably to $450,000. So we're going to have to look very carefully at this stuff. We started um, <coughs> marking up the budget. We've done the easy part so far, and uh, we get into the weeds. This week we had uh, the administration in, and we talked about our reserves and the possibility of combining some of our reserves. Right now we've got a AAA rating, which is wonderful. It's probably the best that most states have and uh, we want to keep it that way. So we'll be hearing more and working on that this week along with the other issues that we've got in front of us. So we'll open it up to questions. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Go ahead. Hi, good morning. I'm Kate LaRose. I'm a St. Albans City resident, and I also work for CVOEO, which serves the county of Franklin um, and Grand Isle, as well as a few others. Um, I think at one point in time I've heard or read every single person up here talk about the privilege of serving in office. Um, and in my mind, that privilege comes with great accountability to constituents and transparency. And a couple of weeks ago in the House, there was the Black Lives Matter proclamation. Um, a number of our delegation walked out and chose not to cast their vote. Um, and others still decided to stay and cast their vote, um, and which, while it may not have been easy, um, is part of the privilege of, um, of being transparent uh, and serving in office. So I thank you for that. Um, in, in, um, in the spirit of transparency, one of the issues that cross-cuts every committee that folks here are on is the issue of poverty. So what I would like to hear is what are your core beliefs about why there are so many Franklin County residents um, living at, below, or just a hair above poverty line? Why are there more Franklin County residents, perhaps, than ever before, that are the working poor? Why do you believe that exists? Uh, I'm sorry, if you don't mind. Uh, Carl or Mariana, do you want to address that? I didn't quite hear the question. Would you like to know why there are so many Franklin County residents who are in poverty? And we don't have enough jobs. That's, that's one thing. Uh, we, our population, we have cyclical poverty here um, across, well, and <clears throat> what is needed are more um, educational programs that train young people into, for skills, that give them the tools that they need in order to go out into the marketplace. We also need to have what I would call business-friendly regulations in the state uh, that do not hamper down businesses' ability to uh, expand uh, for businesses, entrepreneurs to start up businesses, for businesses to come into the state. We have very expensive utilities. Um, we, we, in general, this is a very expensive state to live in. It has become that way. It has become that way because of the policies that have been put forth over a number of years. And we keep doing it. We keep adding to the tax burden, both 
in terms of businesses and in terms of residences, people who, you know, just all of us. And we have to change the philosophy in this state. We cannot be all things to all people. And there is not, there's not a real commitment. They, I mean, there's a commitment to want to help everybody that needs help. But sometimes when you help, you're doing more harm because in, in the long run, it's not help. Uh, so, I don't have a, an instant solution. I'm certainly not suggesting that people who need help, and there are many people genuinely who need help, they need to be helped. <clears throat> we, nobody wants to see anyone homeless or go without food or shelter or have the basic necessities of life met. But we just have to find a different way of doing it and we have to be able to think outside the box because I don't think there's been too much of that kind of thinking happening. We cannot persist in doing things the way we have continuously done it in the past because it's not working. Thank you, Marianne. Carol, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, not really. I think it's a, a tough question uh, in, in terms of why we, you're saying you think we have a higher degree than other areas of the state of poverty? Uh, or the not? numbers of working poor are one of the higher, the, one of the record high levels. Um, right. So not just people okay. living in well, poverty, but people working and living in poverty than ever before. I think we need to continue to try to, uh, as I say, give people more opportunities, get more education so they can they can get into better better paid positions in in our industries and things like that. I, I think that's one of the should be one of our primary focuses. I know Kathy Lavoie who's here works very hard in this particular area. But I think the the biggest thing to do to lift people out of poverty is to give them the, the proper education to be able to get other get employment that pays a higher wage. I, I guess probably the simple core of what we need to concentrate on. Kathy might want to comment on that. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Lynn would like to. Yeah, I'd like to say I'm a legislative trustee on the Vermont State College Board. I've been there now. This is my second term. I get elected by the legislature to serve. Um, we have a situation <coughs> where 40% or a very high percentage of our students who graduate from high school do not go on for any kind of higher education or any kind of additional training. Uh, we had a thing called the Next Generation Study that was done a few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, that looked into this, and it's, it's a recurring problem. Um, relative to other parts of the state, I think Franklin County is in pretty good shape. We have a very diversified economy here. We have opportunities for people at all levels of employment to get jobs and to, and to improve their, their quality of life and their, and their economic development. But the problem with the problem with, with the educational thing is that the vocational centers are there to help people, train people and to help get them opportunities. Um, and, and they are pretty successful at that. We have the Vermont State Colleges, which is something like 87% of their students are Vermonters. Uh, we have their graduates, 84% of them stay in the state. But we just don't have enough of them. They've all got declining enrollments. We have Red Ink through every one of the schools except for Community College of Vermont, which is the cheapest option in the state. It also provides certificates and a whole bunch of other things other than just an associate's degree, opportunities for employment, readiness for college, all kinds of opportunities for young people. We've instituted dual enrollment. We've instituted early <coughs> college. Those are often used at the state colleges and other schools within the state. So we have the opportunities. One of the problems that we have is that we have this declining enrollment, not just in our colleges, but in our, in our, in our K-12 system. In 1997, there's a, a chart that's been given out by the Joint Fiscal Office every year to all of us when they do the report on the economic stability of the state. In 1997, when we started Act 60, we were at our peak of students in the schools. And it's been going down like this ever since. And this means that we have fewer students available to go to the state college system. They get very little funding from the state. And so their tuition goes up. So we're one of the most expensive places in the country to go to school or to get any education. Uh, one of the areas that they help work on at DTC and others is they work on apprenticeships. 
Apprenticeships are earn while you learn. They're incredibly important pieces of our economy that we should be promoting. Um, if you really want to get people off of public assistance and off of public programs, these are the kinds of things we really need to emphasize. Even the Community High School of Vermont and the Correctional Center goes and tries to do vocational programs and try to give people options and the ability to earn money when they get out. And most of them will get out. And they need a way to go and earn a living that's going to be a good living. And it's an expensive program to run in the Correctional Center. But it has success. I mean, we had uh, a couple of years ago, the governor wanted to eliminate Community High School. And we all went on a tour of what was down there at the uh, Correctional Center. And the auto mechanic program, all by itself, has pulled people out of poverty and given them a living wage, an above average living wage. I mean, they can make six figures as a, as a, as a quality auto mechanic. So there's options out there. And we need to go and really make the commitment to work with our regional development, our tech centers, our schools, and, and with places like the Vermont State Colleges. You know, that's where the Vermonters go to school, and that's where we get our employees from. And we really need to help. All those 40% of the people who are not going to college, or not getting some kind of training, or not getting apprenticeships, we have to find a way to get them and, and reach them and get them into school. Now, a lot of them have not had great success in high school. Some of them have not had great success in elementary school. But those are the people we really need to reach. Because those are the people who are going to become the people who are underemployed, in poverty, and off and on, things like opiates. I mean, this is a conflicting, you know, <laughs> They're all intersected, so we really need to work on that. And I think the governor's uh, program that he's looking at and the Department of Ed is moving toward doing more with Tech Ed, and that's really where we need to uh, put our money as far as I'm concerned, because there's more bang for the buck there. We have an uh, aging workforce in the trades, and we need to be getting these kids who have an interest and the initiative to go to work and get into plumbing and electric pieces because they can earn a very above average wage in any of those. So hopefully there's a new person in the Department of Ed that is uh, focusing on tech ed and we hope that we're going to go and enhance the programs that are presently being uh, provided right now and have schools cooperate with each other and send kids to these programs. And it's not just kids. No. It's yes, adults. It's adults. <laughs> and yes. that's the um, the representative, Representative Dickinson, is spot on. And the governor has, um, I think he's put $500,000 into a program that um, is looking to retrain um, adults in the technical centers that exist with shared resources from tech center to tech center. It's, it's a new concept. Um, I know that the former senator, um, Justin Degree, and um, a former House member, Sarah Buxton, have been in our committee quite a bit because we would actually be funding some of the, that program. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's what we need. We need additional educational opportunities for residents in our communities who don't have skills to move forward. And it's, and it's not just high school students, it's a lot of our adults. And I commend the governor for putting seeds in money into that that program um, I wanted to just take 30 seconds or less because I neglected to say something that's really important for this area <clears throat> one of the things that our committee is charged with is um, water quality funding and um, we are in the process right now of reviewing budgets from the Transportation Committee, the Agriculture Committee, and, uh, or agencies rather, and a &R, to look at where those dollars have been expended, what successes we've had, do we need to change the focus of what we've been trying to accomplish, and that's, that's something that's very important in, in, this, um, in this county. We have a lot of Lake Champlain, and we have a lot of 
And while we have also late Carmine that many of us have fought very hard for to make sure that it gets the funding that it needs. And um, so I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, we're going to be expending roughly $11 million um, in bonded dollars for um, water quality. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Kate, thank you for bringing up the, the working Vermonters, um, or the working poor. I think, as Bernie has said over and over on a national, um, to a national venue, people shouldn't be working 40 hours a week and still be poor. And I think to address the elephant in the room, we do have to look at raising the minimum wage. The wages have not kept up with the cost of living in the last 40 years. Nationally, the minimum wage is 725. So you can take your thousand dollars and try to support your family and pay your rent and eat and buy a car and pay for your health care. It's not going to happen. In Vermont, we're a little bit better off, maybe with $1,600 a month, but still with rents at $1,200. These people are struggling. All low-income Vermonters are struggling. Uh, people don't have health care. People don't have affordable housing. Uh, maybe daycare is unaffordable. So I think we have to look at injecting uh, some equity in the bottom because, we, like I say, every chart, any Google anywhere, we are not keeping up with the cost of living in the last 40 years. Production is up, wages are down. And that is why people are working and poor at the same time. And I think, you know, over the next six years, having a raise that will bring wages up a little bit faster than they would have had we not passed this bill. We do have a COLA on the bill that we passed a few years ago, which would get to $15 an hour, I think, in 2026. So this is speeding up the rate at which people are going to reach $15 by two years or, you know, 30 cents a year or something. Um, so hopefully we're on the right track with that and maybe it will address a little tiny bit about the uh, working for. David? Uh, I represent Northwest Peg Access and uh, we're building a 3,200 square foot <coughs> building out there beyond Pegwood Motor. A lot of the problem that we've had is that the cost of the permitting process in the state of Vermont is hampering a lot of these companies coming in. For our 3,200 square foot billing, it's $21,000 in permits. $8,500 we had to send to the state of Vermont the fire department, uh, department down there to have them look at our blueprint and then come up and do a couple inspections. I think it's nice to have permits, but I think your permits, uh, as far as what you charge, are way out of scale. That's my opinion. Thank you. Kathy? Yes. May I add a couple yes. of items? You know, one of the, the, the difficulties that Dave, I think you, you pointed out, is the cost of permitting. And when we look at uh, how difficult it is in Vermont to do business, that is one of the things that adds to the issue of the working poor. Uh, we have great difficulty attracting businesses, and we also have even greater difficulty in retaining the businesses that we have. If we look at something like Rock 10 in Sheldon Springs, uh, who uh, we had in last week, and uh, we had one of the folks come and speak before the, the Finance Committee. This is a company that employs about 150 people in Franklin County with an average wage of $78,000 a year. I think we'd like to have more businesses like that because those are the businesses that employ people who are right now the working poor. But we have difficulty even retaining businesses like that because of things such as our high electricity costs, the highest cost to them. They've got 11 plants around the United States, and this is the most expensive of those 11 plants, principally because of high electricity rates, high rates that are at least in part caused by the high charges of Efficiency Vermont, for which they get very little in return. Uh, that's going to be potentially a deal killer if they can't go into this pool to be able to use those funds on their own property and continue to lose them, it will make them even greater, uh, even more uncompetitive than they are with the rest of their own plants and with the rest of the industry as a whole. 
We look at things like affordable housing, which is one of the reasons that working poor are poor, because they can't afford housing. But when we think that about 30% of new housing costs is spent on licensing, regulation, uh, permitting, and the things associated with it. It's not that we suggest that we get rid of important things like environmental permitting, but we need to make them saner, we need to make them faster, we need to make them more certain so that when people start a permitting process, they know that if they follow the rules, they're going to get a permit. And right now, uh, it's a crapshoot. They don't necessarily know that. So I think there are lots of issues that we can address that can create a more active and a more robust economic environment. And it's a, an economic environment that creates jobs. We cannot legislate the end of poverty. And I think we're kidding ourselves if we do. The $15 an hour minimum wage uh, at least my calculation is it wouldn't kick up a, kick out, uh, to that level of the rate of, of, of the, the COLA that we have right now until 2032 or 34, not 2026. So we're accelerating it and we're doubling the rate uh, of the minimum wage compared to our neighbors in New Hampshire. And for those people on the eastern side of the state, if you ever get in an airplane and fly from north to south along the Connecticut River, you will see all the development to your left, and you will see nice, green, pretty grass on the right. Uh, our businesses is, are going there, and we're, make no mistake, we're in competition with every other state in the nation. And if we make ourselves increasingly uncompetitive, we're not going to get those businesses. Now, that doesn't mean that wages aren't going to increase. Uh, even in New Hampshire, nobody is earning seven and a quarter an hour, at least very few are, because the rate of the just inflation on the one hand, and also the demand for a scarce supply of labor on the other is pushing, wa pushing wages up. If you, right here in St. Albans, if you look at the 10.50 an hour minimum wage, you walk down the street and you take a look at the signs of McDonald's window, which have been there for at least two years, offering $12 an hour on certain shifts. That's what an economy does. Mandating it is not going to do that. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> I'm here to uh, <coughs> propose a uh, two-tiered minimum wage. Everybody's talking minimum wage. Uh, I've advocated for probably the last eight years um, that we give one minimum wage for those people without a high school diploma and those people that have a high school diploma have another higher uh, minimum wage. I do this for a couple of reasons. One, it takes the, uh, dulls the, the edge a little bit to the uh, increasing the minimum wage for the business. And Corey, I'm sorry I missed you on forum last week, but I was called out of state. Um, <clears throat> secondly, uh, it uh, allows uh, people to, to hire high school kids at a, lower <coughs> rate, at a lower rate and keep them employed as they are introduced into the workforce and they learn how to get along with the workforce. And the uh, third reason is it establishes a, a value to high school education. I'm on the MVU school board, and one of the problems we have is keeping kids in school. They get discouraged, they quit, they have no reason to stay because um, when they get out, they're going to uh, earn the same amount as, as somebody who has a, a diploma. And right now, as Randy says, <clears throat> there's such competition for the workforce that the wages are above minimum wage right now anyway. And an easy way for the House to do this, I know it's passed the Senate already, but an easy way for the House to do it would be just to lock the, uh, the wage at its present rate for those people without, without a high school diploma. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions if they have them. I haven't heard any good arguments against it. Everybody knows it had, yeah, it's a good idea, but nobody's taken any action on it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Richard Fieser. I'm with Superior Technical Ceramics over in the industrial farm. Uh, thank you for your service. Can't be easy, I'm sure. Um, my, my thoughts and concerns this morning are based on the fact that uh, our governor has asked us to try to maintain the cost of living. Um, most of everything I heard in general going down the panels suggested that we need to raise the cost of living. I'm equally concerned from the point of view when I saw one of these breakfasts last year. I think the key areas of discussion were the cost of education, the cost of health care, and the cost of our uh, surroundings, the environment, particularly the lake that Dan just brought up lastly. And yet none of those themes 
seem to have the focus of what I've heard today, and yet, in my opinion, still major problems. The cost of education is still over 30% of our budget. If I'm running a business and I don't have enough money, I look to the largest areas and I try to make smaller changes and reallocate them, such as Mariana has suggested. Believe me, I am a big supporter of the State College Association, and I'm a big supporter of people having skills. Business is a pretty simple group, guys. We don't, we don't pay a lot when people don't have skills. And yet, in the training programs you brought up, we weren't discussed. We're a powerful ally. We need skilled people, and we will work with anybody to help make them skilled. But yet, we're not in the discussion, at least what I heard up here today. So, um, those are my thoughts for this morning. But believe me, we don't mind paying for people that have skills, and we don't mind training. We're short 150 people over in the park over here. And we're not paying minimum wage. Thank you. I'll see you after and get contact so that <coughs> Sarah and or Dustin speak with you. Sure. Kathy, can I have a statement? Yeah. Quickly, yeah. Okay, so in terms of minimum wage, <clears throat> following up on what comments that Randy made, over the years, the definition of minimum wage has changed. Minimum wage in its inception was meant to go to people who had absolutely no business experience, have not been in the business world. Mostly it was high school, college students who were getting their first training, their first job in terms of after school things um, and, and summer jobs. Um, and it was never meant to be a living wage. A living wage comes once you have gotten the skills and the knowledge. It, it, it was always meant, minimum wage was meant to be a start. And then you, you depending upon what you have learned, and you ascend the ladder in order to get to that point of being able to have a true living wage. And we, over the years, this has become one and the same, and it isn't, and it is hurting our economy. Because you cannot take somebody who has no skills, no business experience whatsoever, and start them off making an amount of money which is high in terms of many small businesses. Um, somebody who doesn't know how to do anything, pay them $15 an hour? I, I'm not looking, I'm not saying that people shouldn't, I think people look at minimum wage in the wrong way is what I'm saying. Um, and, and I don't know, you know, um, it's interesting having different levels um, for people's experience. Um, Anyway, I, that's it. Thank you, Kathy. I'm sorry. I would like to address uh, Chick Fieser's issues. Um, also, I've, I've served on commerce. I've served on institutions. I'm now on judiciary. I have heard since my first day there that the people who are looking to hire the businesses in the state can't find enough qualified people. This goes right hand in hand with the fact that we have declining enrollments. We also have a, 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 a brain drain of our young people between the ages of 18 and 35 or whatever. They're leaving the state. They're leaving for other opportunities. They're leaving for better wages. They're leaving for all number of reasons. Um, and because they're leaving, we don't have the children in the schools. We don't have the opportunity to educate those children or to have those people go into our, our labor force. This is a real problem. Um, you know, and this is the kind of thing that, that Richard's talking about. There's lots and lots of jobs available. They aren't minimum wage jobs necessarily, although some of them may be lower, starting a lower wage than others. But we have a very large group of middle management people we cannot find. And we can't bring them here, they don't want to come here, and they, we aren't growing our own. Um, training their own people is the number one thing that most businesses do because that's what they really have to do. Um, and they do it, a lot of them, very successfully. When I was in institutions, uh, we got, I was instrumental actually in trying to get money from institutions for the um, 
for the engineering department at BTC so we could get some up-to-date equipment. They wanted, uh, GW Plastics and some other companies wanted to go and have us update the equipment there for the uh, engineering students, the mechanical engineering students. Superior Technical was one of the people that did, that did this through philanthropy. We had companies that donated. We gave them a million dollars the first year, and we gave them a half million the second year, and they had to raise a half million the second year to get that second half million from the state. They raised it, and they went out and recruited money from, from uh, companies all over the state to do it, and Superior Technical was one of them. Business is willing to put their money where their mouth is, and they're willing to help create this opportunity for Vermonters. And we do have a problem, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. And quite frankly, the state college system has got a lot of bread in, and every, every meeting we have discussions about how to improve the number of students in our, in our system, how to recruit more students, how to, how to really make the best use of what we have. And some of them are in dire financial straits. I mean, so we really have to sit down and look at how we go and set our priorities so that we can create this workforce, so we can deal with the poverty <coughs> issues, so we can give people a chance to earn a good Thank you, Lynn. Jim? Uh, uh, this, uh, this wasn't my main uh, topic, but just as a follow up, there's a lot of what happens with uh, the work of poor and the people from actually getting out of that model are two other things we haven't discussed, one of that being um, the cost of daycare and the inability to find daycare, yeah. which really impacts a lot of families <laughs> trying to work. The other is the, uh, uh, I, I work for the, this stuff, uh, I'm Jim Pelkey, by the way, I work for the judiciary. One thing uh, um, is, is the high cost of rental property. You can, if, you did, if you had a mortgage, it's going to cost you less than it would to rent a, a Seeing so many, so many of them coming into the court with, with eviction because they just can't afford to live in these apartments. And that's, and that's a real issue. And I think those two things I bet you'll have to address in the whole work to pour out of that scenario. So it's just a comment on that. But what I, my initial question that I, that I want to ask about is as we know uh, last week that terrible tragedy in Carmen. Florida with the, uh, with the uh, school, some of the children that were killed in the fair haven fortunately to take care of. That's one of the most important things I think in the conscience of Americans right now. I know uh, uh, our legislature isn't going to be able to solve that, obviously, but one thing I am concerned about, and I'm hoping, and I think it's in judiciary right now, is uh, H-876, the bump stock bill. Is that going to go anywhere? I have no idea. I don't know. We haven't thought about it. So, I'll comment on that piece. I think the governor coming out last week um, was, a, was a big move. And, and quite honestly, I got the affidavit from Fairhaven. And it's, it's in, um, it was in the Rutland Herald this week, I think, the Times Tribune, one of them. It, I mean, I would recommend to every Vermonter read it and just see how that situation played out. Basically, this gentleman um, signed himself out of, or this person signed himself out of a mental health facility in Maine um, within a day or so, um, was, was buying a shotgun in, in, in Vermont um, uh, to, to, among other things, I mean, he was going on the dark web to try to acquire other weapons. And it, it, it's, it goes to show you how, um, one, helpless we are in some of this stuff, but two, I think, um, that we really all need to come to the table and have a discussion, whether it's a bump stock bill with Kathy or mental health, having a conversation. Um, I know I've communicated a lot of constituents about it, and you know, and I've said, you know, this is late last week, um, and it's fresh in all of our minds. But in, in my mind, it's, it's as open-minded as I've ever been to having this conversation. Um, you know, I, I think if. And I don't know how, if everyone at this table has read that affidavit, but you really read the last three pages, and, and they're pretty scary when you think about what it means to our children. And, um, um, and they're definitely pieces that, um, you know, movement we have to make. I don't know what the answer is going to be or what the legislature is going to come to. I think it has to, honestly, I think this is a place where Vermont can lead the nation. I think if we can come to a bipartisan solution that, you know, gets everyone at the table and comes to some um, a piece, I think we can. And I'm a pro Second Amendment person. I, 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 I grew up around guns, and, and I'm, you know, very comfortable. But um, I would just recommend before anyone judges anything that any of us are going to say up here, read that affidavit. Read with what 
um, we're confronted with, um, it, it, it's, it, it's incredibly scary. Um, and, um, you know, I, all I can say is uh, I'll be engaged in the conversation over the next few weeks and months. And, um, how do we come to a solution? I don't know what it looks like yet, Jim, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, I think we need to have an open mind and an open dialogue. And I've talked to community leaders, and, and I wouldn't be surprised to see our, our police department have a start a conversation with the community as well and, and bring everybody in and, and have a really community-wide conversation. Because it's not just, we, we, we kind of have to look at this culturally too. It, it, we, we just have to start communicating on it. And it's it's going to be a really tough issue. And, and like you said, probably some of the stuff, from reading that affidavit, even if we had passed, some of the stuff people asked in the past, when I, this guy went onto the dark web, bought Bitcoin. Had Bitcoin not had, not had the bottom fall out of it, he would have had an AR-15 from the dark web. Um, he would have had, he was going, um, so the dark web for folks is basically untrafficked, but you know, think of like the black market. He was going in um, to that. He was monitoring the police officer at Fairhaven High School when they were taking their breaks and how he was going to get date. March 14th was the date he was going to do I mean, that's how real this was. Um, and so this is, I would read the affidavit. Um, I know it touched, I, my wife and I read it together Friday night. Um, and, you know, we um, were touched by it. We're open to the conversation. Uh, like I said, more than I've ever been. Um, and, and, and we'll see how it plays out in the next few weeks and months. Just uh, clarify, I'm also, yeah. uh, I've been a hunter, I'm a Somerset commander guy, I hold my four rifles, a shotgun, and a couple of handguns. I'm not, certainly not suggesting that we over regulate this, but I think that the bump stocks, large capacity magazines have to be regulated this way. Okay. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, back to the economy, excuse me, back to the economy for a minute. I think one of the most devastating things we can do to our economy. I think uh, one of the most devastating things we could do to our economy is passing the carbon tax or the estimate plan. And I'd like to know my personal who's really in favor of the Essex plan. And really, my person who's in favor. Anybody in favor of the carbon plan? You know, I don't think that's quite fair because uh, most of us fair. have not even seen the Essex plan. That, so, I have not seen it. I, I don't know how many have. It's, have. it's not something that is being discussed in the House right now in a oh. general way so that we would know what's in it. Uh, who was working on the Essex plan? So we, we were, um, we've taken a couple of days of testimony on it. Um, you know, as it is, I don't think it has much support even in the legislative body, but um, there's definitely support for a concept of, a, of carbon pricing or a carbon tax. Um, the biggest proponents right now of the Essex Plan are organizations like Ben and Jerry's. Because um, Ben and Jerry's, the way the Essex Plan works is you pay so much, it, it grows over eight years, but you pay so much per gallon of fossil fuel tax, but you get a rebate on uh, your electric bill um, to try to make it as close to revenue neutral as possible, but it's not revenue neutral because we have to pay for the administering of it. Um, ben and Jerry's would see a million dollar net gain out of it because they've deferred all the carbon costs to St. Albans Co-op and Franklin County Farmers. Um, so Franklin County Farmers and the Co-op would be paying a lot to not get that benefit. You know, the Co-op just has is the trucking arm. They have, you know, Ben and Jerry's basically, from what I got, doesn't own any trucking or any transportation. So the milk comes from the farm to the Co-op, gets processed with fossil fuels. They're a big natural gas user, and the cream gets put on a truck that again is owned by the Co-op and brought to Ben and Jerry's. So. Um, I think the companies that are really pushing it see a net gain out of it. Um, I think it's a harder push for, if you, so the average, from, we saw the testimony, the average for modern would save about $13 a month on their bill. Um, if you're low income and rural, to meet those definitions, it could be up to $30 or $40 a month on your electric bill. So um, that's the benefit proponents are saying of it. Um, but you're already, we've got testimony from folks who do carbon pricing uh, and saying that that's not the best way for the state to actually decrease the use of carbon. If the goal is to decrease the use of carbon, you need to take that money and spend it on other things, not give it back in electrical rebates. And so I don't see it moving forward this year, but I think what you're starting to see between the study committees and us doing it is they're gearing up to pass something. Um, you know, it, it's, I've always said, you know, BPIRG was pushing a couple summers ago. BPIRG is the strongest lob lobbying wing in, in the legislature. They spend the most money. and. Usually they're pretty good at getting things to become law within five to ten years of when they're pushing them. So, um, you know, I'm against it. It wouldn't have the votes to get out of my committee. 
today, but um, there are more folks in favor of the concept than this actual thing. But um, we'll, we'll see how. I'm not in favor of it. Um, okay. That's been pretty clear. But you know, I'm listening to the testimony <laughs> and, and, ha and um, you know, trying to understand it so I, you know, we can kind of communicate it to folks. But um, that's you know. But somebody so, that lives in Newport, what's it going to cost them to heat their house? How much more is it going to cost? Them? Yeah, it would depend on what they're. How much more is it going to cost when you get to their job? And well, and in the argument where the carbon tax folks are saying <coughs> it saves money, the calculation they did build in, I really question them, is their assumption is everyone's going to move to an electric vehicle. And they're using today's electrical vehicle costs, but I brought up what uh, Representative Murphy said. Well, yeah, but eventually you're going to have to take. 50 cents of your gallon of gas right now is taxed to pay for roads, federal and state. We've got to figure out how to shift that to the electric cars if we if we go to that piece. And so therefore that $400 a year savings may not be a $400 a year savings because we've still got to pay for the roads. So we, we have to have that, you know, they weren't, the numbers that came to us weren't perfect. Um, you know, we looked at the first, the analysis that the Essex group did. Um, but you know, we we spent about six hours of testimony on it as a committee, which is an insignificant time. Um, you know, I, I, I suspect by the end of the session we'll spend twenty to thirty hours on it, um, just really kind of gearing up, and that's not counting what Steve's committee's done. Um, so it, it's definitely got more traction than it's had in the past, and I think you know they're going to kind of need to ramp up that conversation. So um, whether you support it or not, I think it's a it's something good to at least ask about the concept to your legislators. Mayor. Good morning, thank you for being here. My name is Mary Pickner, and I am a town, San Angeles town resident, also an employee of the Department of Health, and I'm not working today. Um, but I did want to uh, throw a little bit out there for our two, two particular subjects. Uh, one was uh, when we look at education over the past few years, there has been a big change into uh, children with deficiency, which is a fantastic opportunity, particularly for students to be able to learn in their own way and the way that works, um, and also to be able to essentially develop great employees in the future. And I really do applaud that. Um, and the other piece of that is a personal learning plan where children are able to learn with what they're interested in and meet those proficiencies. Um, my experience in the past couple of years has been a little difficult, is that uh, my students, my children, have had these great opportunities to have a personal learning plan. Um, not very personal, with the legislators, you know, legislation that has made it so that you do have a personal learning plan. But the follow through to, from legislation to actual use seems to be messy. Um, so they have a personal learning plan as long as it falls under whatever the school is just deemed their personal learning plan should be. And when it comes to things like proficiency, uh, when that started in uh, my children's schools uh, uh, as a ninth grader, so last year, the proficiencies were not developed by the agency of ed until after April. So my child had an entire year of essentially seven different proficiencies because there was no consistency from because the agency of ed hadn't developed them and the, the schools hadn't been able to demonstrate. What I do know is that we've been doing proficiencies forever. And what I would like to see is that when we do this type of legislation, that there is accountability at the other end. Because currently I have a child who has great interest in science. He also um, is on a 504 plan. And the way that uh, the personal learning plan and the proficiencies are met are through the traditional 1970 checkbox of making sure you get all your credits. And so due to a little bit of a snafu in uh, the freshman year, it's going to be a real challenge for him. Um, so his needs are not going to be met, they're not um, in the interest that he's in. And so for me, when I look at things like people, children who are interested in learning want to learn, they want to be able to finish their, uh, their schooling, they want to be able to work, I think, with people in technology, it's very difficult to do math and science um, and, and check all the 1970 boxes um, that need to happen. And so for me, when I look to the futures, I would like to be able to have measures put in place that are asking schools to do what they ask, rather than saying, yep, we're doing a great job and we're doing almost nothing to make those changes in the future. Because we are looking at a smaller number of students coming through. We need to better educate them, not just push them out. And the push out rates in our communities are significant. 
And so when a child is pushed out of school and are asked to have a lower rate because they were not able to be available to learn in the very narrow <coughs> focus that we have, it's not fair to our children, to our economy, and our resources. And sometimes our, the folks that are in our schools have really complicating issues, and I would like those to be thought of in the form of a personal learning plan and meeting those proficiencies. Um, my other thing is when we look at the things that happen in uh, New Haven, regardless of what the Second Amendment is, in your opinion, is, is that we do know that hurt people hurt people. And that if we don't look at that as a primary way to, uh, to change things, um, none of that's going to change. It doesn't matter how much legislation you do. We just really have to address hurt people that hurt people. So people who are not well do unwell. Thank you very much for your time and coming out. Jonathan? I'm Jonathan Dillard from Northwestern Medical Center. And I want to go back to something that Dan touched on early when going down the list, was the forensic facility for mental health care in Vermont and the impact it has on cost of health care and the, the world of the emergency department. And the more we use our emergency departments around the state as a safety net, they're a very expensive safety net. They're there to save lives. And so if somebody their eight or nine days, they're not getting the right care, their safety concerns, their cost concerns, et cetera. So as that um, continues to go forward, I'd really encourage folks to look carefully at it and understand the need for that type of bed. And then just to follow up on, on Lynn's comments about workforce development, I had a chance to do some of the new employee orientation. And more and more we're seeing folks come to the hospital who are LNAs, who have, have achieved their, their licensed nursing assistant and they come in with the intention of becoming an RN. And they work through our programs and through Vermont schools to achieve that and they move up and it's just the, it, that's the path to go, is to help folks climb that education ladder so that they can start working and then continue forward into even better jobs going forward. So anything you can do to support that and, and to allow us as a major employer to continue to invest in those things and to invest in <coughs> prevention so that we can cut future health care costs by continuing to invest in reducing smoking and improving health, et cetera. It's a long-term investment, but it's important, and it, we need the, the funding within our, our systems to be able to make those long-term investments. Thank you. Jonathan, there actually is a rollout of the forensic unit uh, the last three months of the fiscal year, which would be uh, uh, $1.5 million, so it would be a total of $6 million a year. Um, I also wanted to say something about uh, special ed, kids on IEPs, because we have had a quite an extensive study done that has brought to light a lot of the issues around why it's so expensive. And I think that the Ed Committee, is that right, is going to be working on that bill this year. And getting the kids out of special ed that have special needs like in reading and math and not have them taken out of the classroom while those things are being discussed with their peer group, but give them additional uh, opportunities to have those issues addressed that they're having trouble with. So I think there's going to be a big difference in the way special ed is handled down the road. And I don't know. Is there a bill coming out? Yeah, it should be, we should be getting it. Yeah. I think also if you look at the way that you are driving your education, a lot of those costs will be reduced just by changing the way that instruction is delivered. And I'm not asking teachers to make great changes, I'm asking administration and the agency of ed to actually follow through on what they've been tasked, tasked with. And it would be, you know, we all know that special education is very expensive and it has to be essentially a billable service today. By your, your looking at that differently, it's the way that we also look at prevention. It's like how do we catch people earlier in the, in, in the process and changing the way that we deliver education to all students will do that. And I appreciate that. Thank you. I think that's really important. Um, and also, uh, and looking forward to that. I'd like to address one of Mary's issues. Uh, one quick point. Quick, quick, quick. Um, for those of you who can remember mastery learning, this was something that we had in the supervisory union, I believe, maybe 
City School years ago was trying to create that accountability and it got a lot of resistance from parents. I don't think people understood what it was trying to do, but there wasn't anything really wrong with it, but it was just a matter of, um, you know, education seems to go through these fads. They come, they go, they come. They're all trying to do the same thing. Um, I believe you're talking about the flexible pathways legislation that we did a few years ago, it was Act 77 or something. I did get some resistance at a school board meeting from a principal who really felt that we were just asking too much. I mean, I understand that um, that's what we put in the dual enrollment. We would be allowing people to go and work at their own level. Some children can work faster, some need to take more time. It's really, the IEP is the one that's for the special education, but the personal learning um, program is for everybody else. And it takes time and effort and, and a, a long, and a real effort to really figure out what each child's learning process is and what their style is and how to help them do this. But that was what we were doing with early college, to get kids who were seniors who could go on to take college courses free, basically, and get a step up so they could better afford college. Dual enrollment was allowed for juniors and seniors to take college courses. Sometimes they're taught in the classroom, sometimes in the schools, in the high schools, sometimes they're taught at CCV or wherever you happen to go. And those were an attempt, again, to help kids get, who may have been bored or may have been uninterested or to get them college credit as quickly as possible, as inexpensively as possible. Um, the nursing programs that we have at BTC and that, um, that really allow people to earn their way up to the next level and then go to the RN. I mean, there's, there are people who are teaching at BTC who started with that program and now have their master's degrees. So those things are there. Are there. But you're right. It, it's just day-to-day -day, trying to get through the day kind of thing can make it difficult for the kind of um, accountability and follow who you're talking about. And that's something we really have to go. We can't legislate that. We have to go and create a culture to do that. Matthew? Kathy Boy, uh, Director of Workforce Investment for the Region. Uh, workforce is always a subject lately. There's so many things I could say. Most of you have already heard it already, already as has the general public. But um, one, one thing I'm asking each of you to do while you're having that workforce discussion. And um, I'll I'll ask that you remember this uh, example. I have a young woman that I placed about four years ago in a job through my program, um, and she all along wanted her LNA. Um, she <laughs> is um, working in one of our facilities here as a PCA in, in a sense. And um, over the course of time, has gotten married, has a beautiful young woman. She's a wonderful young mother. Lisa Brocher and I met with her a couple of weeks ago. Uh, has a husband that's working at a local manufacturer, making good money. They live up in Innisburg. She so desperately wants her, her LNA and to go through the program. And the barriers to employment for her, despite everything she has going for her, are incredible. They have one car. Again, they're both working, one of them making a, a very good living at a local manufacturer's. They have no internet, even working with her, to, to be able to get online and sign up for the non-degree grant at, through VSAC as an endeavor for her. Um, Ver, Vermont, um, the non-degree grant at VSAC is a <coughs> tiny, tiny bit of money looking to, to support a whole host of people in those training programs that are not eligible for um, financial aid um, through the rest of the BSAC programs. Um, and um, child care is a huge issue. She has a supportive family, as does he, but with the, the classes that are happening um, down here in St. Albans, it's still an issue. How do they rotate the car? How do they drop off a child? How does she get home You know, at 9 o'clock at night? So um, the barriers that she has as a working, intelligent, aggressive young woman are still there. So when we talk about um, the barriers to employment, um, we need to think, of course, extreme poverty, people that have every addiction, people, you know, uh, generational poverty, all of those things. But what we're, we cannot miss is that those barriers to employment are for everybody, even those in a category that um, we would be so blessed to have her as an LNA with a goal of being an LPN or an RNA, and yet she still has huge barriers. So those are the issues that you need to work on, not just what is the training program.
what do we need to do to get the people that want that training program into it and be successful? Thank Thanks, you, Scott. Scott. Thank you for all you do. Yes. I mean, you're a gem in our community. Yeah, just a quick question. Okay, go ahead. ahead. Um, I'm Paula Schramm from Amosburg. I, uh, I was concerned about a couple things in the governor's budget that I heard would be cut, and I'm just wondering if anyone knows the status on the funding of the personal attendant care program, those people that are paid to live in a home with a paraplegic and help them be able to stay at home and live with the community and with other people. Right it. now that program has been cut. It has been cut. In the governor's budget. In the governor's budget. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with that. We've had a lot of dialogue about it. There's been a lot of discussion <coughs> in our committee. As I say, we're reviewing the, the governor's proposals, either ups and downs. I just was surprised so, at that because he talks about not hurting the most, but it's required to, have a, right. to keep the budget down, but don't hurt the most vulnerable. And those people are certainly the most vulnerable. Right. The other question is about the uh, healthcare advocates, you know, the ones you call and you're having trouble figuring out being billed wrongly and all that. They, they're being cut off. Well, we're budget. looking into the legal aid budget because that's where that is. <coughs> they have money spread all through the uh, budget that we're looking at this week. Well, I, I sure hope this other program can yeah, the make it PCA through. is uh, 142 people knocked off that program right now. So we'll see what, what happens with the budget. And the navigators are something that I've been working on for over a year. So it's not lost. Well, thank you everybody for coming.